Good morning, everybody. We are greatly honored to have two distinguished lecturers this morning uh, for this uh, morning session. Uh, Professor Knut Urban uh, is going to start with the first lecture. Um, Professor Urban is the head of the Institute of Solid State Research in ULIC since 1987. He's been the director of the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, Max Planck Institute für, uh, für Metallforschung. And then he moved to the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, and he was the director of the Institute of Materials there. In 1996, 1997, he was a visiting professor at the Institute for Advanced Materials and Processing in Tohoku in Japan, Tohoku University. And between 2004 and 2006, he was the president of the German Physical Society. Uh, Professor Orban received many prizes, and I think uh, the most important of them I, I will cite is the Von Hippel Award from the MRS in 2006. Uh, this is the title of his lecture. He's going to talk about new electron microscopy material science in atomic dimensions. Professor Orban, please. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm also indeed uh, very pleased about the invitation and the possibility to talk here about uh, what I have been fascinated about uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, of course, this invitation brings me back to Israel. Uh, I think I have visited Israel about 30 years ago the first time, and I have many friends here, and I'm pleased to see some of them here in the audience. In the end, all scientific research originates from inspiration, and this means it originates from vision, and with this remark, Albert Einstein places science side by side with uh, philosophy and art, and the story I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, indeed uh, has started with a vision, and the starting point uh, was the lecture by Richard uh, Feynman just 50 years ago at the annual meeting of the American Physical Society at Pasadena, and the title, there is plenty of room uh, at the bottom, was become the visionary starting point of what we call today the field of uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology. While this may be well known to you, it is not so widely known that Feynman's most famous lecture is a plea for the urgency to improve the electron microscope. In fact, Feynman was concerned about the possibility to validate what has been synthesized or had been synthesized uh, and uh, in atomic dimensions. And in particular, he wanted to read uh, what had been uh, written uh, in atomic dimensions. And uh, it, uh, he just uh, elaborates on the possibility to do this with the electron microscope. But he says the only trouble is that the electron microscope is 100 times too poor. And he just finishes his remarks about electron optics I put it out as a challenge, is there no way to make the electron microscope more powerful? Now in Feynman's day, there was little hope to be able to meet uh, that challenge, and it's only recently uh, that uh, we have been able to uh, take this visionary step forward by the introduction of aberration correction. And since about uh, 2004, 2005, uh, we have an entirely new generation of instruments available, uh, commercial instruments, which uh, give us uh, full atomic resolution. And these new possibilities are meeting the growing demand of nanoscience and nanotechnology uh, for an atomic scale characterization of, of principles, of physical principles, uh, of devices, and nanosynthesized uh, products. 
However, the atomic world is the world of quantum mechanics, and beyond that, we are seeing the atomic world not through our own eyes, but via the eyes of electrons. And therefore, it is not surprising that against common belief, to understand the atomic scale results is generally not at all straightforward and only possible on the basis of extensive quantum mechanical computer calculations. In the following, I would like to give you a brief insight uh, into uh, this exciting field and in order to give you a better understanding, just to introduce you uh, to that in a more pedagogical way, I would like to embed this story into a general description how ultra-high resolution electron microscopy is working. And for this, let us have a brief look on the basic principles of atomic imaging. Just let us assume that we have an unknown structure, which I have written here as a sum over delta functions, which are centered at the atomic positions R sub i, and we want to measure this atomic structure and want to find out uh, the type of atoms uh, in these particular locations. And for this, we employ an electron wave field. And while the wave field just penetrates through the sample, it interacts with the interatomic potential V of R. And the information on the structure, uh, let's say on the potential, is then contained in the wave function of the electrons at the exit plane of the specimen. And I have written here the exit plane wave function uh, as a, a sum over Fourier components. So we have here the Fourier amplitudes. And here we have a phase factor, which is uh, controlled primarily uh, by this spatial frequency uh, g. Now, the important point is that this wave function contains all the information we can get from the specimen, not more and not less. And it's also important to know that uh, this information is carried by electrons as our probe, and therefore uh, these, uh, it's, it's just encoded in the quantum mechanics of the interaction of the electron wave field uh, with the uh, interatomic uh, potential. It's the exit plane wave function and not the sample itself. It's the exit plane wave function, which is the optic, uh, which is the object for the following electron optics. And if we have an ideal lens, we then have an in image intensity distribution which is proportional to this exit plane uh, wave function. When we have aberrations uh, in real lenses, this means that each of these Fourier components here uh, is multiplied by a phase factor, and the core of this phase factor is the so-called aberration function, which I have written here for simplicity in two terms only. We will see later that we need up to 14 different aberration terms in order to do atomic resolution microscopy, and we have to know them, we have to measure them, and take them uh, into uh, account. And uh, then when we, of course, m uh, multiply with these phase factors, we get an, a new modified uh, wave function and therefore also a modified image intensity uh, distribution. So let us just have a look at this aberration function. This is the so-called spherical aberration term. Uh, this is a technical uh, constant, uh, the, the spherical aberration parameter, the electron wavelengths and the spatial frequency again. Here we have the defocus ter term, and this means it's just coming from the fact that an electron lens has not a given focal length. You can easily vary the focal length by just playing around with the currents through the objective lens coil. So this is the defocus parameter, the wavelengths again, and the spatial uh, frequency. So the other terms will come later. So now let us just recall briefly what spherical aberration uh, is. The Gaussian uh, image plane is defined by the paraxial rays making a small angle with the optical axis. And spherical aberration means that if you now use a bundle uh, of electrons making a large angle with the uh, optical axis, uh, then uh, they come to a focus much in front of the Gaussian image plane. And as a result of that, a point P 
in the object is not imaged into a corresponding point in the image plane, but rather in an operation disk of a radius R, which is given uh, or proportional to the derivative of the operation function, which we uh, just got to know a minute uh, ago. Now, in light optics, uh, it's common technology since the end of the uh, 19th century uh, that you can compensate the spherical operation of this converging lens by combining it into a system uh, with a uh, diverging uh, lens, which is suitably calculated uh, just uh, to uh, make uh, the, uh, uh, the focal lengths of all these rays uh, equal, and therefore the point spread in that sense just uh, disappears. Unfortunately, this type of principle cannot be followed uh, in electron optics to, to the Maxwell equations, but I think it suffices to say that um, uh, magnetic fields have to fulfill the Laplace equation, and as a result of that, there is no way to construct with round magnetic fields a uh, diverging lens. So it took till 1990 until Harald Rose, who, is this, who was the successor uh, of uh, uh, Otto Scherzer at uh, his chair at uh, Darmstadt University in Germany, uh, succeeded theoretically to calculate a diverging lens. It consists of two hexapoles, which are coupled by uh, a transfer lens uh, duplet, and I don't want to go into details. I only want to show you the ray path, which proves to you that this is a uh, diverging uh, lens, and we had between 1991 and 2001 the privilege to realize uh, this uh, uh, concept of Harald Rose uh, in, in practice. That means we were able to construct an operation corrector, implement it into uh, a commercial microscope, and thereby prove that this uh, principle uh, was working. I also want to come back to this one here. Uh, if you want to do optics for atomic dimensions, you, of course, have to deal with all these operations. So, and these have to be measured. And you can only do this by quantum mechanical scattering experiments. So these are an intrinsic part of the, of the realization uh, of operation uh, correction. And here you see all the operations, 14 different operations, which have to be measured, compensated, or taken into account in the calculations uh, which we'll, we'll see, uh, which we learn about uh, in, in a few minutes. Now. So after all this is done, you have an operation corrected instrument, and the one which we have still in operation in Jülich was the mother instrument of a whole new uh, uh, generation of instruments built by all major electron optics companies in the world, and they offer you a sensational increase uh, in uh, resolution in the sub Angström uh, range. Now, just let us have a look at this pair of images. This is corrected electron optics, and we soon discovered in the first years after 2001 an entirely new imaging mode, uh, which replaces the traditional Scherzer imaging uh, in high resolution. I don't want to go into detail now on this. Uh, we had some talks yesterday uh, on the NCSI technique, but just let's have a look at this barium titanate uh, image. We see the barium, the titanium, and also uh, the uh, oxygen. And now look at uh, an image of the same material uh, taken in an uncorrected uh, instrument. So here we clearly have atomic resolution. Here we have not. People have in the past very often taken such images here as atom atomically resolving. That's not so. These images are interference patterns of electrons which have no atomic resolution uh, uh, qualities. So just for fun, let us have a, a look at strontium titanate, strontium, the titanium, and the oxygen. I emphasize oxygen because oxygen was not visible directly in any electron microscopy before. That means now, with operation correction, you have the, for the first time access to a very, very important uh, element uh, in, in a large family uh, of materials, uh, the oxides. Here we have uh, gallium nitride, and here again we have an element, nitrogen, 
which was not visible. The microscopy was blind with respect to another key element uh, in material science. And here we have silicon nitride. Again, we see uh, the nitrogen close to the silicon atoms. Now we have to ask the question, how do we know that these bright spots are the atoms? Nobody tells us this a priori, that these are the atoms. That means we have to find out uh, how contrast is occurring in atomic dimensions. And for this, we have to treat uh, contrast by quantum mechanical and optical image calculation. And that this is necessary and not trivial, uh, you will see uh, now in the, in the following minutes. And before I do that, I want to extinguish in your brains what about 90% of all people believe, that uh, electron microscopy in atomic dimension is some sort of shadow casting. That means an electron wave comes in, and then you get some shadow of images, uh, of atomic images. This is entirely wrong and misleading in addition. There is no shadow casting. The, all the electrons that come in also come out. So the only way to understand this uh, is to do a solution of the Dirac equation, calculate the wave function, and then care about the image intensity uh, distribution. So just have a look at that, just for a proof. We did the solution of the Dirac equation. We have relativistic electrons. Therefore, we have to use that equation. And now we just increase the thickness of the sample in the calculations in this direction. And we also vary the objective lens uh, focus. Now, here is the unit cell of strontium titanate. And now just let us see what the images are as we calculate them. And uh, here we have, obviously, at the spot of the strontium, we have a dark contrast. OK, atoms obviously appear dark on a brighter background. So this also works well for oxygen, but it doesn't work at all for titanium. The titanium atoms appear bright. So now let us go down here. Obviously, now the, the strontium atoms appear bright. OK, you'd accept that. And it also fits well to titanium, but it doesn't fit at all to the oxygen. This appears dark. And uh, when you look more closely, you find here two bright spots. And when you, when you just accept that atoms appear bright on dark background, here are two bright spots which do not correspond to any atom at all. Or when we come here, you may have the impression that this is somehow a double uh, a strontium atom because we have this broad contrast. But then we have contrast here where there are no atoms at all. So this means without calculation, you cannot understand. Just look here. We have many so-called atoms around that where there is no atom in reality. So in order to understand these images, of course, you have to deal with this problem uh, more in detail. And uh, now I want to, to point out, so far we have always looked into forward direction, from structure to images. But for image interpretation, we have to go from images back to the structure. That means we have to invert the highly nonlinear scattering uh, problem to find out what our goal was, the structure. So fortunately, uh, since about uh, 10 years, uh, we have available a technique to go from images to the electron exit plane uh, wave function. But this does only work if we operate the microscope as an interferometer, not as a single imaging uh, device. That means we take a series of images, typically about 20 or so, and in between each of the images, we vary the objective lens focus. This means we are probing the face of the electron wave uh, in this way. That means the microscope is operated as an interferometer. In atomic resolution, the microscope has to be, in general, operated as an interferometer. And then we plug these images, pixel by pixel, into a computer uh, software, which uh, in this case here is developed. Uh, in, in our laboratory uh, and is offered commercially now. And uh, this uh, converges towards the complex electron exit wave, uh, wave uh, function. Now, two more steps have to be performed. You have to come from here to here to the interatomic potentials. Very difficult 
to do this. And in addition, then, from the potential, we have to go to the structure. So far, there is no way to do this uh, in the backward direction. We are working on this, and we are, we are close to a solution. But in the moment, uh, we just rely on a forward calculation, which starts with a first, uh, you know, first guess model of the atomic structure, and then we derive somehow the interatomic potential. Then we have to solve the Dirac equation and hope that uh, the wave function obtained this way fits to the experimental one, which it does. It does, of course, normally not in the beginning. That means we have to readjust the model. And if you do picometer resolution, uh, picometer microscopy, as I will show in the following, uh, this means uh, you have uh, to, to move uh, about 100 atomic positions down to picometer dimensions. And in addition to that, you have the problem that the thickness, as we have seen, which is very important, cannot be measured. It's not possible to measure the thickness of your sample in atomic dimensions. There is no scale available which allows you to do that. The only way to get access to the thickness is to do a scattering experiment. That means your image process itself is the scattering experiment which gives you the thickness. This means that you have to use the thickness as an adjustable parameter in your fitting process. Now, there is another parameter. This is the direction of incidence of the electrons. Very sensitive with respect to the result of the calculation. No access to it. So this also is a free parameter. And I think from now it should be clear to you that atomic resolution electron microscopy does not produce images. It produces a model in the computer memory of your structure. And this is the result. And now we have to care how we display this to people uh, like uh, you in the audience. And there are many ways to do this. For instance, the so-called projected potential approximation is very often used. But what is probably more important is now that we can select by doing, uh, starting a calculation from the computer model and following the imaging process, we can now select the image which resembles most the structure which we have derived. So the images which I'm showing to you or which I'm publishing, these images are selected in this way from this whole sequence. But just as a warning, if you don't do this here, if you don't do all these calculations, these images are a priori worthless. They do not give you any reliable information at all. That means without calculation, no chance. Why? Because our brain understands light optics, but not quantum mechanics. So we have to use, for image interpretation, we have to use a brain which understands quantum mechanics, and that's the computer. Okay, that's now the principles. Let us have a brief look at three examples which illustrate what I have just said. So the first one comes from our work on yttrium barm carboxide. I have a very active superconducting group uh, in my uh, institute, and we are working on uh, Josephson uh, junctions on the basis of yttrium barm carboxide. And one of the possibilities to get a weak link or a, uh, a Josephson a junction in general is to use a grain boundary. So we have spent a lot of time investigating grain boundaries. Uh, here, the 90 degree tilt grain boundary in yttrium barm carboxide. And here we have a view on the complex electron exit plane uh, wave function. We have the amplitude and the phase. Now let us go uh, through all uh, the, the, the computer uh, calculation. And now we have a look here uh, at the grain boundary. And you see the, the tilt of the yttrium barm copper oxide uh, unit cell by 90 degrees. We have a 90 degree tilt boundary. And before I go any further, I think I should show you that we indeed can see the atomic uh, structure of yttrium barm copper oxide. Uh, uh, and here you have the unit cell. Uh, we see the copper atoms, uh, and we uh, see the body centered barium, yttrium, and barium atoms, and we see in between the oxygen atoms. Even small differences we can see. For instance, the oxygen atom close to the small yttrium is moving a little bit downward. 
And uh, this we can nicely see and measure. So this should uh, suffice to show you that we can identify all the uh, individual uh, atomic positions. And now let us have a look at these copper atoms here. We have a copper atom pair, and you see that the corresponding pair here is a little bit wider. And uh, in addition, we see also something uh, special here. We, every third copper atom in the, directly in the boundary shows a weak contrast. And you also may see, in spite of the lights, you may see that the, copper, the, the oxygen atoms, these are these faint shadows here, are relaxing towards this uh, copper uh, uh, atom. And to cut a long story short, I, I only want to show you the, the model uh, which we have derived from this interface. And here we have the smaller yttrium atom and the larger barium atom. And uh, you see that these two copper atoms here are a little bit more closer because of this neighborhood. And uh, here these uh, two copper atoms are by 44 picometers more uh, apart uh, due to the diameter of the barium. And you can see this directly uh, uh, here. Now let us uh, go to this uh, strange contrast here. Uh, and this arises from the fact that three upright standing unit cells do not fit the lengths of a lying unit cell. And you get mechanical uh, stresses uh, there, and as a result of that, you get a zigzag motion of the, uh, elect of, the, of the copper atoms, which is equivalent to a static de Barvalo factor. This reduces the intensity here, and oxygen is highly mobile in these materials and contributes uh, to a reduction uh, of, the, of the strain energy. Now we can do this all quantitatively, uh, uh, which is, is uh, another advantage uh, of operation corrected electron microscopy. And from that, you can derive uh, displacement maps. Here are the two problematic uh, copper atom positions. But now look at the yttrium atom. The yttrium atom moves into the boundary by nine picometers. The large barium atom is pressed out of the, ba uh, of the uh, boundary by 11 picometers. And in this work, which is uh, already a, a few years old, uh, we have been able to measure this at a precision of uh, better than five picometers. In the meantime, we are at about three picometers, and the, the team and pico generation uh, uh, instruments uh, available now uh, by, from FEI and other companies, they will go down to a precision of one picometer. So that's a number people would have not even dared to dream of uh, only a few uh, years ago. Now let us apply this uh, to uh, in an investigation of ferroelectric domain walls in PZT. Uh, PZT stands for lead zirconate uh, titanate. Uh, it's a, a technically uh, often used uh, at, uh, ferroelectric, and people are now really working hard to incorporate PZT layers in uh, microelectronics. Just to recall what ferroelectricity uh, is, let us assume that we are at high temperature, and under such circumstances we have a highly symmetric unit cell, and in an ionic approximation we can say that the charge centers, the negative charge centers here provided by the sum of the oxygen atoms, just coincides with the positive uh, charge uh, center of the cation, uh, the, the lead and the zirconium and the titanium. And therefore, we don't have on a unit cell level an electric moment, no dipole formation. So now we cool down, and the cooling is accompanied by a phase transformation uh, and uh, this leads to a change of the dimensions of the unit cell. All these atoms here are shifted with respect to the lead atoms, uh, and uh, we get a non central symmetric uh, structure. And now the, the, the negative and positive charge centers do no longer coincide, and as a result of that, uh, we get a dipole formation on the unit cell uh, level, and we can measure uh, these dipoles, as you will see in a minute. Now we have investigated PLD uh, layers between uh, strontium titanate, and here you see a low magnification overview, but fully atomically uh, resolving. For this, we, we just magnify. We see the, the lead uh, atomic planes, the lead positions, the zirconium titanium positions, and now you see the oxygen here. The oxygen is going out of this atomic row. Uh, it's, it's, it's higher here. 
And we can conclude from that that we have an, a, 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 a dipole uh, formation on the unit cell level in this direction. And you can now measure all these small atomic shifts inside the unit cell. We do the same here, and we see that now the oxygen is going down here. That means, obviously, the polarization direction is opposite uh, to this one. So somewhere in between here must be a domain wall, and we just can find it by measuring these atomic positions. And so we find that this is the ferroelectric domain wall. Now, this is a schematic of this domain wall. Just have a look at this uh, uh, part here. Uh, and you see that the dipoles here just meet each other head to tail. And as a result of that, the electric fields of the dipoles just compensate, and there is no field energy uh, in, in, involved uh, in this type of configuration. Now, when it comes to this part here, uh, we find that the dipoles are just colliding head on. And this means that the electric fields are not compensated, uh, but uh, uh, enhanced. And this leads to a high field energy, and this is why all theoretical work in the past has predicted that such domain walls would not exist. So you see, we have discovered such domain walls, and of course, we then also have to, uh, to ask the question, how does nature get along with this high field energy? And for this, we have measured uh, the, the width of the domain walls. First, we take here an inclined domain wall, uh, and on the left-hand side, we can now follow the oxygen atoms. There is no measurement in that sense necessary. You see it directly. Of course, we have made the measurement, but you can see directly that uh, we have a dipole still here uh, visible. Now we go to the other side. The oxygen is up. So obviously, the direction of the electric moments, the dipole direction, just changes uh, with, uh, over the distance of one projected unicell. That's the smallest distance possible. Now we go to the uh, longitudinal uh, domain, uh, wall. This is the geometric locations, and now we measure into these directions the individual atomic uh, positions, and these are the results for the c-axis parameter, for the a-axis parameter. We can derive the c over a ratio, and we can measure the individual atomic shifts for oxygen and for zirconium titanium. And uh, I would like to emphasize here the accuracy of these, so this accuracy here is better than five uh, picometers. The precision is better than five picometers. So what we see here immediately is what happens there. This domain wall is very wide, 10 atomic distances, unit cell distances. That means the system just, nature just expands the width of the domain wall to keep uh, the uh, uh, energy uh, uh, low. Now, I would like to emphasize in particular this uh, plot here, because here we have the macroscopic uh, 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 polarization. This is the value which you can measure macroscopically. But we have derived it from atomic measurements. So these measurements are converted into the macroscopic polarization. That means we can derive values for parameters which we can measure directly from atomic dimensions, which is an old dream uh, in material science. And uh, just for fun, let us go to the uh, last uh, uh, example. Uh, it's the effect of a single dislocation in strontium titanate substrate on the permittivity of epitaxial PCT. That means it's from the same work, but uh, a very peculiar type of observation, which I always found very, very fascinating. Um, so uh, just, um, again, the preparation PLD, and we now look at this interface uh, uh, here. Uh, low magnification overview. We see the interface between strontium titanate and PZT. And then we look a little bit more closely into the contrast here, and we find there is something wrong. Uh, and uh, a detailed investigation tells us that this is a split 110 uh, dislocation. Now, as a result of the, the uh, presence of the dislocation, we get a, 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 a strain uh, which is just uh, going into this direction, and it, par it crosses the boundary. So all these displacements here, which originate from here, they penetrate 
into the PZT. So again, we can uh, do an atomic study. Uh, you have seen this before, and we can derive now these parameters of this interface on the atomic scale. The first result, of course, is that we have a tilt here of the interface by about a degree. And now we can measure atom for atom or unit cell for unit cell. We can measure the displacements of these uh, unit cells as a result of the presence of this uh, stress field uh, of the dislocation. So these are the results. And uh, you see that, for instance, the C-axis lattice parameter decreases here in this direction, decreases in this direction. This means that polarization is lost or reduced at least. And uh, when we follow the oxygen atom shifts, we get the same result. Uh, that means measured atomically, we get a reduction uh, of the uh, uh, polarization uh, as a result of the dislocation. From that, now we can calculate again the macroscopic integral uh, polarization. When we use the C-axis lattice parameter, we can use the landau ginzburg devonshire uh, theory. This is well developed uh, because people in the past used X-ray uh, measurements, uh, of course, in a different scale. Uh, and uh, so this is the, uh, the theory for that. Uh, we nowadays can measure the atomic shifts directly. Therefore, we have a much more direct way to calculate uh, the uh, macroscopic polarization. And uh, this is the result. That means this is the observable uh, uh, quantity. And you see that the presence of this dislocation has reduced the ferroelectric polarization by 50 uh, decrease in spite of 50 percent, in spite of the fact that the dislocation is so far away from the interface. So I would suggest that in the future we also take into account such type of uh, effects when we discuss the famous dead layer effect. That means the reduction of the dielectric or ferroelectric properties uh, close uh, to a interface. So now I'm at the end of my uh, talk. Uh, of course, today. We have what Feynman uh, felt uh, we should have available. That means we can nowadays study uh, atoms, atom positions, uh, atom movements uh, directly. And obviously, we can even do more than what Feynman uh, had in mind. Uh, we don't look at the atoms only. We look at the physics of atomic motion uh, in uh, these uh, dimensions. Of course, Feynman, the giant in quantum mechanics, would have immediately understood uh, that seeing in atomic uh, dimensions uh, follows uh, its own laws, uh, it follows quantum mechanics, uh, and is by far not as trivial uh, as we are used to uh, in light microscopy. So as a result of that, we see operation correction has allowed us access into, uh, this, uh, into these atomic dimensions. I think we also see there is some beauty uh, in all that, some color, uh, which is uh, connected to a new field which has been opened up by this type of uh, microscopy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions. Any questions? Maybe one question. Um, is it possible to correlate pictures like this to local stress fields, for example, around the dislocation that you showed at this resolution? Uh, yeah, of course. You can measure the individual. You can measure the individual atomic positions, and from these, uh, you can of course get an atomic model of the dislocation. Uh, we have done studies like that, and people afterwards uh, in completely different groups have done uh, up initial calculations uh, to, uh, with excellent uh, agreement with what the measurements were. Uh, there are some issues uh, which have been uh, interesting for the people in the past. For instance, uh, when you uh, have uh, uh, twins in, in dielectrics, uh, the twins uh, 
were felt that they are oxygen deficient and therefore they had particular electrical properties. Also there we did the, the proper picometer resolution measurements uh, and, and uh, the, the calculations uh, were done uh, separately with the best possible methods of today and we always got excellent agreement. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Wayne. Um, we see more and more evidence for defects being offset from the interface, delocalized, if you will. Yeah. And from atom probe tomography, I think we've seen more and more evidence for excess uh, segregation, which is not at an interface. The lattice, uh, the dislocation that you showed us, is that a lattice dislocation, or is this an in intrinsic part of this particular interface? Um, and how we have seen we from time to time this? such dislocations. They are always standoff dislocations. Uh, so the and the distance from the interface also appears to be within uh, a certain arrow margin similar. So I think it's, an inter it's, a, it's a dislocation which was introduced to reduce interfacial stresses. Uh, so I think when you would minimize the overall elastic energy, it would, be all, it would come out that the interface dislocation should not be in the interface itself, but should be a little bit more deeper into the, strong, in the strontium titanate. You see, the, 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 the films were, of course, deposited at high temperature. So you have uh, some freedom uh, to introduce these dislocations and put them into the elastically optimum position. There was another question. Yes, uh, hello over here. Yep. Uh, many of the examples in Richard Feynman's speech involved biology and organic materials. What, what are the implications of this microscopy for dealing with organic materials? Um, I think. First of all, he talked about molecules. He talked about the chemistry in atomic dimensions. And he said the only thing you have to do is to look at the atoms. Uh, it, it's, of course, not as, as, as easy as that. But uh, when you just look at, at molecules, people have been able to localize uh, at least well-scattering atoms in molecules on substrates. So from this point of view, I think Feynman, uh, Feynman's view uh, is realized as well. On the other hand, it would be always difficult to find a proper substrate. So people have uh, found atoms on even graph uh, graphene substrates. Uh, what this always is, I don't know. People have felt you just put an atom like hydrogen, uh, you know, the Zettel group type uh, of, of work in the U.S., people have felt you put a hydrogen atom on a graphene substrate and then you see the hydrogen atom. This is, of course, not, not realistic. You have to have a chemisorbed hydrogen on the substrate. Otherwise, the electrons will kick off uh, the hydrogen atom quickly. So in any case, also from this point of view, Feynman's prediction is fulfilled nowadays. We can see individual atoms in molecules. Uh, as far as biology is concerned, um, the problem in biology is that you, the, the resolution is mainly limited by radiation damage. That means only in very few cases you are able to image organic molecules uh, with full atomic resolution simply because the molecule is dead. Uh, when you have the, the proper dose, uh, uh, which would allow you uh, atomic resolution. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation.